victory. Our first Bible reading is taken from Job chapter 22, verse 2 to 5. Job 22, 2 to 5. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Shall we listen to the word of God? Can a person do anything to help God? Can even a wise person be helpful to him? Is it any advantage to the Almighty if you are righteous? Would it be any gain to him if you were perfect? Is it because you are so pious that he accuses you and brings judgment against you? No, it's because of your wickedness. There's no limit to your sins. This is the word of God. Our second scripture reading is taken from the gospel according to Luke chapter 17, verse 7 to 10. Luke 17, verse 7 to 10. I'm reading from the English Standard Version Bible, the ESV. Let's hear the word of God. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come home, come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly? And serve me while I eat and drink. And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the word of God. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we have come before your throne of grace. Help us this morning, Lord Jesus. I please that you will not dismiss us from your service. But as born servants who are unworthy, you will grant us the grace to serve you faithfully with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our spirit and everything that is within us so that your glory will be displayed through us. Speak to us, Lord, in living echoes of your thorns in Jesus' name. Amen. L-I-C. L-I-C. We thank God for the opportunity to share his word. As a church, our theme for the year has been safe to mature in love and service. And for the first half of the year, we looked at Christ-centered relationships. And for the second half, we are looking at Christ-centered service. And this morning, for our consideration, we'll be discussing the sermon topic, We Are Unworthy Servants, or Born Servants. Now, it is important for us to note that when we are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not saved to be spectators. We are saved to serve the Lord. And many times we don't serve probably because we lack understanding of what has taken place. We are not only saved to enjoy the benefits in Christ alone. We are saved to serve him and to bring him greater glory and honor. And this morning we will look at how God sees us. When we are saved, what is our status? And we'll be looking at that from three broad themes, and then we'll look at our response. Basically, we'll look at our status as believers. We'll look at the duty that is required of us as believers or servants, and then our attitude 
as servants in his service and what our response ought to be. Now, when you look at the passage before us, especially the Gospel of Luke, you realize that there are a number of things that he begins to talk about. And here we are talking about Jesus Christ. There are a number of things that he highlights that should characterize the life of the believer. And so right from verse 1 of Luke's Gospel, when you look at chapter 17, verse 1 to 10, there are a number of things that he talks about that should characterize the life of the believer. And so he talks about the fact that we ought to be truthful, we need to guard against sin, we ought to forgive one another, and then he talks about the fact that we should have faith. And then now he talks about serving the Lord dutifully. And this morning, we'll be considering the last aspect of what we are required to do as disciples or as believers, serving the Lord dutifully. And when you look at the context in which this story is given, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, people around him, and then he begins to give them certain instructions. Now we said that we are unworthy servants. And so in the verse 7, he begins by raising certain issues. And that is where we find the word used there, servants. And he begins by saying in the verse 7, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come from the field, Come at once and recline at table? That is the question that Jesus asked there. Now when you look at the context in which the word servant has been used, you would realize that the Greek word for that is doulos. And that simply means you are a servant or you are a slave, depending on the context in which it has been used. Now we know that when someone is a slave, all their rights and privileges, they have ceded to their master. In fact, they become the property of the owner. And so, in this context, we are told that we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his slaves. And then we look at bond servants. What do we mean when we say someone is a bond servant? A bond servant is a person or an individual who voluntarily offers his or her service to others. It may also mean a person in permanent role of service. And so, as believers, we are called to be born servants of the Lord Jesus Christ for life. It's a life of total commitment and devotion to the master. Now you are wondering, why are we saying that we are slaves or we are servants? When you look at the scriptures, you will realize that God talks about our salvation using various slave terms. The first is that you will notice that he uses the term, we have been redeemed. It's a slave term, to be redeemed. Meaning that you buy back something from someone. You place it with something else. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, we are told that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we have been redeemed from our sins. Christ Jesus has purchased us from our sins. He has bought us back from our sins. He has redeemed us from our sins. So the redemption given us through his salvation ultimately means that we have become his servants for life. Not only that, in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, we are told that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
Again, we have been redeemed from all the curses of the law. When you take time to read Deuteronomy chapter 28, you would realize that God gives a number of commands. There are blessings and there are curses. And for each of the laws, when you break them, you come under a curse. And if you take time to study, you will realize that the curses outnumber the blessings. But it's interesting that Christ Jesus, when he took on our humanity, fulfilled all the demands of the law on the cross, and therefore qualified to redeem us from the curses that we incurred as a result of our disobedience to the law of God. But not only that, our debts have also been paid. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, we are told that, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debts that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And so our debts have been paid. Every legal demand that stood against us, we are told that by Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary, he paid all our debts. No wonder on the cross he cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished. Every legal demand, every ordinance that stood against us was paid in full. But not only that. You also see there are terminologies that indicate that we have been bought at a price. First Corinthians chapter 6, 19 to 20 says that, Or do you know, do, know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within whom you have from God? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And terms like ransom, all of these are slave terms. So we were slaves to sin. And we have been redeemed by the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No wonder you find the apostles, Paul, Peter, James, Jude, all address themselves as servants and apostles. In other words, slaves and apostles of Jesus Christ, born servants of the Lord. And that is the first thing I want us to know. That is our status. We are servants. We are slaves to someone. And that is Jesus Christ. Bible makes us understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we will attain his righteousness. It's a whole package. Galatians 3, 27 tells us that don't you know that when you were baptized, you put on Christ. And so the owner, the one who has control over our lives, we belong to a certain master, the devil, when Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord. We lost that authority to him. And Christ came to redeem us. So our status is that we are servants. Bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in service to him for life. Amen. And so this implies that when you are a believer, you are called to service. But this morning, we are looking at it in the context of we are unworthy servants. And so, in the verse 7 to 9, we are told about the duty of the servants. He tells us about the duty of the servants and there are a number of things that he outlines for us to pay attention to. He says, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table, Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you eat and drink? Does he thank the servants because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you, have, you were commanded, say we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. 
The first thing you note about the duty of the servant is that he or she faithfully obeys all the commands of God until all the work is done. All the commands, not some. He carries out all the commands that the master has given him or her until everything is done. Now you will realize that the servant does not pick and choose which aspect of the work is suitable or not. Every demand of the law. And here we are told that we are called, this servant is called to plow, to care for the sheep, and then when he has done all these things, he will come back from the field. And he wouldn't recline at table. He will go and prepare the meal. He wouldn't just prepare the meal and come and sit. He would dress properly and come and serve the master. And when the master has eaten before, he would even take his food. And there are no thank yous for everything that he has done. He only says that I am unworthy. I have done what was required of me. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 says that the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandment. For this is the whole duty of man. We don't pick and choose God's command. We are expected to obey God in every way. We don't pick and choose. Now, when you look at the kind of service that the servant is required to offer, it tells us that it takes some endurance, some energy to carry out those things. Because plowing the field will require that you exert your energy and not only that, when you come home, you have other responsibilities to do. And so, it takes endurance to serve, to carry out everything that God has given us. Does that mean that the master does not care? What really is the master teaching us by all these demands that is laid on the servant? The first thing we note is that he is teaching that we should set him as priority in our service. There are other things we may consider important, but prioritize your service to God before those things. It is not that the servant doesn't have any other responsibility. They do. Responsibility towards themselves, but they prioritize their service to the master. And so we also must do the same, and we should give the master our best. But not only that, that service that the master is demanding requires endurance. But you would realize that Jesus is unlike any master. When he calls you, when he offers any service to you, he adequately equips you to be able to carry out those services. In fact, when you read the story of Israel when they came into the promised land and the Lord called them that they should make an ark of the covenant and build a tabernacle. He told Moses to do it exactly according to the pattern that has been revealed to him. But for him to be able to do that, we are told that he called to himself two men, Bezalel and Oholiab. And we say that the Lord put in them his spirit so that they were able to carry out the design according to the pattern that was revealed to Moses. God adequately equips. And if the service he calls us to requires endurance, we are told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, one of the fruits of the spirit is long suffering or endurance. Why is that given? So that we will be able to carry on the mandate that the Lord has given us. In fact, you will realize that without these fruits, one fruit manifesting in nine ways, we cannot even accomplish what the master has called us to do. Because first, we are told that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. 
all these are God's divine endowments to enable us to carry out our service as born servants of the Lord. And indeed, Jesus tells us that whoever wants to be great must be a servant. And whoever, whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. Mark chapter 10, verse 43 to 45. But not only endurance is required of the servants to accomplish his task, he is also required to be diligent in his service. Because you realize that this servant moves from one thing to the other. Well planned, carefully thought out, and follows through with everything that is required of him. So there is diligence. Those are the lessons that we are learning through this servant from this passage as we look at the scriptures. And so those are the duties assigned the believer to obey every command that is given, to prioritize God in the service that we are offering, to endure, to be disciplined in the things that we have been, have been entrusted into our hands and to be diligent in them. Diligence is required. Many of us treat the service that God has given us with disdain and we quit so easily when we start facing persecutions of all kinds. But it is for that reason that the fruit of the Spirit has been given. Self-control, endurance, love, joy, without which you cannot do these things. And so what is the attitude of the servant? What should be the posture of the born servant in service? Now you will realize that in the verse 10, there is something interesting that Jesus brings to our attention. He says, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Here, we are being called not to have a sense of entitlement to the service that we are rendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are unworthy. It is a privilege of all the people God could call and entrust his service to. He chose me. He chose you, broken vessels as we are, to display his glory through us. We are unworthy. And so he's teaching us to serve the Lord with humility, not a sense of entitlement, not because you deserve it. You don't deserve it. You don't merit it. Sometimes when you look at your educational qualifications and the places God has led you to, you yourself, when you look at your, the trajectory of your life, you will say, I'm here by grace. Some people say that carelessly. It's a cliche word for some people. But for those who know where they were, where the Lord brought them from, and where they are going, how far they have come, they say that with a heart of gratitude, that everything they have accomplished was not by their own strength. It took the grace and the favor of God, placing them at certain opportune places at just the right time. At just the right time. Not because you have earned it, in these days in our world, it is about me, what I can accomplish. And God's role in what we have accomplished is removed totally. But we are told to have a heart of humility. We must be humbled in the way we serve. We are not worthy. And so we have no sense of entitlement. The temptation is for us to think that because we have accomplished A, B, and C, we merit God's favor. When you read the Gospels, there's an account of a man whose servant was sick and sent the Jewish leaders to go and call the Lord Jesus to come and heal his servants. And when they went, they said that this man, he is kind to our nation Israel. 
He has done many good things for us, and he is worthy of you. But the man himself said that, I am not worthy of you, Jesus. I am not worthy. Don't even come to my house. Just speak the word, and it will be done. They went presenting him as worthy. But he knows that on the scale of God, he doesn't measure up. And those are the kind of people God is proud of. Those who see their unworthiness and surrender to him. Not because we have paid our tithes. Not because we have fasted. Not because we are not like the tax collector. As in Luke chapter 18 verse 9. But the one who would not even raise up their head to the Lord and say, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Jesus says, those are the people God justifies. Those are the people who are in right standing with God. That is the kind of attitude, a humble posture, an attitude of humility. That is what the Lord requires. And so this morning, I want us to remember that we are born servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. He owns us. But not because of any good thing we have done. Because in, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, and this is how God demonstrates his own love for us, that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. From every part of scripture, when you look at the true diagnosis of who we truly are, we realize that we are not deserving of God. And he still chooses us. It's an amazing truth. It's an amazing love. And so what should be our response as believers? We are saved to serve. What should be our attitude? We are not saved to be spectators. So what should be our response? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, we are told that for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God already has good works prepared beforehand that you and I are called to do. And so here in LIC, there are many opportunities for service. But before you sign up, examine your motives. Are you coming to serve the Lord as a transaction? That God, I have done A, B, C, I'm in prisons ministry, I'm in reception and hospitality ministry, I'm in the liturgy and chapel preparation ministry, I serve you all the days of the week and I do all these things. Lord, I have come for my paycheck. Examine your motives because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. The motive with which we are serving, that is the where the Lord examines. All of us can praise you that you are doing well. But on God's skills, it's zero. You have done nothing. You have already received your praise. And so there are many opportunities for service. In the prayer ministry, in the, in the prisons ministry, where you can reach out to adults, inmates, or juveniles who are at the correctional center, and many acts of service, which God has already prepared for us. Are you willing when you look at the bond servants, the servant does not give up. I'm sure there are times that he's plowing the field and other things, he gets discouraged by the enormity of the work, the task that he ought to do, and yet he or she perseveres through. And so when you are serving in ministry, there are certain people in ministries, they specialize in criticism. They have a critical spirit. They are perfectionists. Everything you do, they will comment on it. Even when everything has gone well, they will say, today, you did well, but these shoes that you are wearing. 
they will always have something. But don't give up. A bond servant does not say, because I have been criticized by another servant, I have stopped the work of the master. People will criticize. There will be people who have critical spirit. They see everything. But look at it this way. Flip it. Sometimes God puts us in the company of such people to refine our own character. Because sometimes the criticisms are founded. You might be careless. And so you need that correction. But sometimes too, they are unfounded. And it is to test your patience in the Lord. And the only way you can grow, the only way God will transform your character is not to live in your bedroom alone and tell us that Christianity is in the heart. You will join us online. No. It's to put your hand to the plow and be actively involved. Then your patience will be tested if you are truly patient. Then your love will be tested if you are truly loving. Then your endurance level will be tested. Then we can know how much pressure you can endure. And that is how God refines our character. Living alone as a Christian will never refine your character to be like Jesus. It's only in the context of service. Why? There are people at various levels of growth. Some have matured to a certain level. Others are maturing. Their response to issues will differ. Different temperaments and ways of serving. God will use all of that for his glory. Hallelujah. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 24 says that bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleases, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, ask for the Lord, not from men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance, your inherit, the, the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let your service be transactional. Do it as unto the Lord. Many have shipwrecked their faith because they felt a sense of entitlement. God, I have done A, B, C. And you have allowed this trouble to come through my life. Why? Why did this loved one of, man, of mine die? God, after all the service that I have labored for you, why? That mindset will shipwreck your face. You are not God. God allows bad things to happen to us for his greater purpose. We may not understand it all, but we are told that we would have perfect knowledge when we are with the Lord. And so we don't give up. Serve us unto the Lord. It is not only in the church, even service to your spouse do it unto the lord they don't deserve it they don't it's not because they deserve it you are doing it because jesus requires that of you it is your duty to honor the lord in that way that is the reason why in spite of all the negative words they have spoken to you you have chosen to live with them and sometimes when you do that it has the power to disarm very wicked spouses of their wickedness because they have no basis of accusing you anymore because in spite of all that they have done they see that you are not moved you are still serving and that will cause them to ask like in first peter three fifteen, ask you for the reason for the hope that you have and we must do it with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience. Don't procrastinate your service, fellow born servants. Many of you think that when I'm old, when I'm going on retirement, I will serve the Lord. Who, what is the guarantee that you will go on retirement? Before you can, there is no guarantee. No one is, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. It's now. And so today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I call you to service to one and only master the Lord Jesus Christ. Criticisms will come, endure. Discouragements will show up. Your character will be refined, but do not give up. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 38, it says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You cannot procrastinate. Bond servants, 
fellow born servants, we are unworthy. It is by grace I have preached this sermon to you. My duty has been done to my master. Shall we pray? Almighty God, awaken us to the urgency of service. Many of us are slacking in zeal, sleeping over the work that we have been given. But we know that we don't have forever. And so we cry unto you, Lord, have mercy upon us. We have forgotten that we are born servants. We are called to permanent service to you. Rekindle those passions. Set the fire ablaze on the mean altars of our hearts to serve you with diligence for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We appreciate you joining our service today. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking on the logo and don't forget to like and share. See you next week. God bless you.